You know, I hear that. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Raymond Arabello. I am the Assistant Director of Alumni Programs for Young Alumni. And thank you for tuning in for the Young Alumni Life Series, Managing Debt. Um, we have three speakers with us today um, that are going to share their advice on how to manage debt and everything you need to know as well. Um, just a few reminders to use the Q&A below on the bottom of your screen if you have any questions. Um, we'll do our best to get to all the questions as well. And of course, you can use the um, chat feature to let us know where you are tuning in from. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our speakers and have them introduce themselves. Andrew, we'll start with you. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm Andrew Lin, Love It 2002, um, was computer science and economics at Rice, and afterwards kind of found my way into finance, uh, working at a hedge fund, and then now as a financial advisor with New York Life. Uh, really looking forward to answering your questions and, and um, just helping highlight a lot of uh, the things that, you know, people have problems with. Raymond, should I go ahead and should I go, go ahead, Crystal? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm Crystal Maxwell. I'm a financial advisor at UBS. I uh, got my graduate degree, my MBA at Rice at the Jones School in 2003. Um, and actually before that, was uh, got my undergrad at the University of Houston. So, um, you know, and I will echo uh, what Andrew said, um, you know, in my position, what we do, we help people with their finances. So ha happy to do that Thank you. Uh, I'm Antoine Pedo. I graduated in 05 from Baker. I studied religious studies and studio art, both of which degrees were not particularly useful to my current career in finance, but that happens sometimes. Uh, like Andrew, I also am a financial professional at New York Life. I specialize in retirement planning and estate planning mainly, and I'm excited to, to help everyone get off to a good, a good start to their post-rice post world. Perfect. Thank you all. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started uh, with the first question. Andrew, um, we'll start with you. In your opinion, what is the most common type of mistake that people make that get them into debt? It's a, it's a great question. And the most common mistake that I see people make is that they have no clarity about their money. They really don't know how much they're spending and that becomes a real, um, a real issue because now you, somebody becomes overextended. Um, when I, you know, I think it's important to kind of clarify what your goals are, right, in, for the short term, medium term, and long term. And especially with debt, you know, it's just knowing how much you spend so that you don't spend more than you make. It's a, it's a really simple equation as to kind of how that all works out. But once you have clarity into how much you're spending, you can cut out, uh, cut out additional expenses. Um, and then don't forget that as you, as you grow into your career, you can make more money. And so knowing how much you spend so that you can spend less than you make, um, hopefully putting away money towards some of your retirement or other savings goals um, and, and, and just knowing what, where you want your money to go. Sorry, Anton, we're having trouble hearing you. Sorry. Um, if I could just add real quick, um, there's, there's a, people need to understand the difference between just consumer debt and, you know, more like investment debt, you know, not all debt is bad. Most of you probably went into debt to get your, your rice degree. And the, uh, you know, obviously the idea is that you borrowed money, you're paying interest on it, but ideally th th what you've invested in is gonna allow you to make more money, pay off that interest and ultimately, you know, come out ahead. Um, consumer debt, that's just buy, you know, you, you want a nice car, you can't afford it. Well, well you know, just finance it or it, consumer debt is just buying things that you can't afford uh, with debt. And that should, that should pretty much be avoided, you know, by now buying a house, that's a kind of, that's an investment. You probably need, you probably won't be able to afford an entire house all at once. So you have to borrow for that. Um, again, you know, maybe going to grad school, if you need to take out some more loans, that's the kind of investment debt. So not all debt is bad, but don't, don't get, don't get, don't take out debt simply because you can't afford something because all, all that means, so, so you can't afford to buy a Lamborghini. You're going to finance it. Oh, so you're going to pay more for it. That doesn't, that doesn't ever make sense. Perfect. Thanks for adding that Antoine. I appreciate it. Um, so next question here, uh, when talking um, about credit cards, for example. I know uh, you had mentioned um, consumer debt, um, Antoine. Uh, what tips can you share on how to use your credit cards wisely? And is there any specific, is there maybe your favorite credit card um, that you could recommend? I'll start with you, Antoine. Um, 
I'm not sure what a specific company to recommend, but uh, I would say, you know, credit cards, um, interest rates can be 18, 20, 24%. That's really high. A lot of them will get you with a six month, no interest period, right? And then six months later, all of a sudden you start getting hit with eight, 22% interest. They kind of, they lull you into it. Uh, credit cards, honestly, the best way to use a credit card is puts, you know, use it for convenience during the month, charge, charge some things on it, um, get your, your bonus mile, airline miles, whatever incentives, get your cash back rewards for your gas, you know, on, in your gas tank, you know, kind of try to maximize all that. But at the end of the month, pay, pay your entire balance off because if there's no balance, there's no interest. And the credit card companies don't, this is not their business model. The credit card companies don't give you a credit card so you can pay your balance off every month because then, then they, they don't make a cent. You're costing them money. Um, they make money on those 18% interest charges on your balance. Um, so really, I, I would have a, have a credit card. It helps to, to, to build your credit. Um, your credit score will be better if you do have lines of credit that are available. And if you're not you know, maxed out on those lines, um, your credit will obviously be better. And you know, if you can, just pay them off. Just use them as, a, as, a, as a, a convenience when you're out and pay them off every month. Don't pay any interest. That's the best way to use them. That's what I would say. All right, Crystal, you're on mute. All right. Um, I just want to add that the uh, the bonus points that most credit cards offer is really a valuable thing. So definitely pick out a credit card and use the credit card most that has the best points system for you. So now a point one point system might be better for one person versus another just based on you know what they're giving you know if somebody you know is is trying to save up to take a vacation then perhaps one of the airline uh cards is going to be best and then you can get your airfare free you know down the road um, for other people it's a gas card you know so pick whatever it is that that is going to benefit you most and then find the best card that um, you know has that feature because those bonus points um, in in fact ha have become one of the largest currencies that are available around um, in these days so um, definitely take advantage of that but then I would absolutely echo Antoine in that you don't put anything on your credit card that you don't have cash for right now. Um, a, a credit card should not be thought of as a loan. Uh, it's You should just use it as convenience. Perfect, thanks for that Crystal and Antoine. Um, we'll go on to that next question. So this is more of a scenario. So worst case scenario, let's say you've looked at everything and you're looking at declaring bankruptcy. Is there anything else um, that you should look at before declaring bankruptcy? Uh, Crystal, we could start with you. All right. Um, so, you know, declaring bankruptcy is obviously a big deal. It's going to stay on your record for a minimum of seven years. And for some instances, actually longer than that. Um, a lot of employers also will do a, a credit check or require you to disclose that thing. I know in the in the finance industry, um, we certainly have to disclose that and, and can't even be hired uh, if you have a, a bankruptcy in your past. So I, I mean, absolutely, that's something that you 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 want to try to avoid um, at all costs. But um, on the flip side, if you've gone down that road and and there is no other way out, also realize it, it doesn't have to be the end of the world. Um, you know, there's been plenty plenty of people who have filed for bankruptcy in their lives and, uh, you know, uh, have become president or something like that. So, um, you know, you, you can get through it, um, but definitely uh, the e what I would suggest is um, any outstanding debts that you have, if you go to that particular lender and try to work out a payment plan in advance of you know, getting all the way down the road to where bankruptcy is looks like the only option. Um, lenders w are generally more than happy to help you pay them back. 
And so um, most people, most of those companies, uh, whether it be the credit card company or the light company or your mortgage or your rent or whatever, uh, will be amiable to coming up with a payment plan. Um, and so definitely try to exhaust all of those efforts first. I would, um, I, those are really great points. I think it goes back to kind of what I said about clarity of your own money and kind of where you're putting money. Um, but do remember that kind of certain types of, uh, of, of debt are not, won't be forgiven, kind of like some student loans won't be forgiven. And so I, Crystal brought up the great point of going to your lenders to say, hey, you know, we're, we're having a tough time what can we do? Um, the the pandemic and the coronavirus really highlighted some difficult issues people were going through, and a lot of lenders had were um, were you know available to talk about individual situations to make changes to a payment schedule, maybe um, push it out a little longer, uh, or so on and so forth. So there are ways to kind of mitigate these kinds of worst case scenarios um, and, and work with the lender to kind of uh, re, you know, uh, to see what is available for you. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out to them. Perfect, thank you for that, um, Andrew and Crystal. Um, Andrew, you had mentioned about a student loan, so that's kind of like a good segue into uh, this next question, um, which I'm sure all of you have experience with pro probably, but let's talk about student loans. So for recent graduates, I think this really applies um, a lot to our young alumni population and, you know, and then, and then on, of course. Um, but if we're trying to get out of debt from our student loans, what would you recommend is the, the best way, the most economical way, especially if we're on a tight budget? Um, Andrew, we can start with you. Yeah, great. Uh, I think with, um, with loans especially, whether they are credit card loans, student loans, whatnot, is to get a better understanding of what the interest rate is that you're paying on all of these loans. Oftentimes, somebody will have multiple loans um, that are kind of bucketed into student loans that will come with different interest rates. And, you know, some will be um, federal, subsidized, unsubsidized. So a better understanding of what your loan situation is uh, that, you know, I, I tell people, especially on the, on the debt side, you want to know kind of what the minimum payment is that you're going to be paying, um, the interest rate, and what you can do is there are calculators out there that will help you kind of determine which one to kind of best pay off first. And one of the methods is to just the, the mathematically, right, the, the fastest way is going to be putting the minimum payment on all your all the individual debt. Then any extra money that you're putting away is going towards the most expensive debt. And that may be your credit card, uh, your credit cards, right? Because those are 16, 18, 20. Um, Antoine had kind of mentioned um, a lot of student debt is anywhere between I've seen like four and a, four and a half, four and a quarter, all the way up to kind of seven and eight percent. And that is a big spread. Um, and so thinking ahead and saying, okay, working with, um, you know, the, the consol uh, potentially working with the consolidation company just to say, okay, you know, all the, any extra money that I'm putting away, I want it to be directed towards my highest interest rate debt. And that will get you closer to, you know, that'll get you to the finish line, finish line uh, faster for sure. Um, that's probably the, 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 that is mathematically kind of the, the, the easiest way. I don't know if there's other kind of ways that, um, that you'd want to uh, put money, uh, if there were other economical ways, I don't know if Antoine and Crystal know of other ways as well, but whatever's the highest one is generally the best that I've seen. So um, that is, is def I would agree that that's the best way to do it. Pick your, your highest interest rate and pay that down first. There is another school of thought 
Um, if anybody's familiar with Dave Ramsey, he, he says a, a different way to do it. And it comes down to the research done in buyer behavior or investor behavior. And, and his theory is that um, you, you want to feel like you're making progress more quickly. And so he says, pick your smallest balance and pay off your smallest balance first, get that out of the way um, and, and go that way. So you that's one of those things that you need to evaluate about yourself um, that, you know, do you wanna do it the mathematic way so that you're paying the least amount? And that would definitely be go with the, the largest interest rate first. Uh, but if you if you feel like you need some motivation to, to help help you along the way, then sometimes it's easier to pay off the smallest balance first. Now you have fewer balances to worry about and then and work your way up to the larger balances. And often the larger balances are going to be your, your student loan, I would assume. And if you have a home, your mortgage debt and that sort of thing, which typically have relatively smaller uh, interest rates anyway. So um, that's just an, another uh, another strategy to go about it. Sorry, Antoine, you're on mute. All right. Once you graduate and start paying back those student loans, you, you typically your lender will give you a bunch of different options. You know, you can pay the bare bare minimum um, up to up to higher amount. Be careful paying the barest barest minimum because sometimes that. If you're not even cover, if your payments aren't even covering the interest rate increase, then you're paying you're paying money and you're getting more and more in debt. This is where you hear those horror stories of people say, you know, I borrowed fifty thousand dollars in student loans, I've paid thirty, and I'm sixty thousand dollars in debt, right? Because the interest is going up faster than pay. And then you know you may be tempted to defer your loans. Student loans are easy to defer for hardship for you know a year at a time. Um, your interest is growing while it's deferred as well. So this is how people, you know, they borrowed on fifty thousand dollars, and all of a sudden now they're they got seventy five thousand dollars of student let loan. So don't let that happen to you. Don't you know you need to pay off more than just the absolute bare minimum that they'll let you get away with. I'll I'll add one more thing that I just thought about is um, some have loan forgiveness programs. Uh, so if you're going into public sector, there can be loan forgiveness programs. Definitely research the details on that and keep in touch with your loan provider to make sure that you're doing all the things you're supposed to be doing um, to remain compliant with that. Um, in the last, you know, five, 10 years, that has been a big issue. And I don't want anybody to be surprised when it's not forgiven, right? So be sure to follow up and, and really kind of know the details. And at this point, it really is kind of documentation for yourself, patient, you know, when you're contacting customer service to say, hey, I talked to so-and-so, they told me, you know, these are the details of my loans and that I'm on track. Uh, be sure to get stuff uh, written, you know, in a letter. Uh, it, it's harder to, to dispute that. So um, know exactly what you're kind of getting into and, uh, and make sure that you're kind of on top of it. Don't, you know, it, just because um, it can be overwhelming back to kind of the psychology of it, it can be overwhelming, uh, but it's, it, you can get out of it. Perfect, thank you all for that. Um, kind of going off of loans here. Uh, so we all have heard of those payday loans. Can you maybe talk about um, the disadvantages, any warnings for that, and maybe if there's ever um, a good time for a, for a payday loan? Um, we'll start with Antoine for this one. Um, well, we all know payday loans charge, I mean, they'll charge 10, $15 every two weeks per $100 borrowed typically. And if you annualize that, you're talking 400, 480% interest, which you know, sounds almost exploitive and usurious. Um, if you don't have to take a payday loan, don't do it. Um, obviously, it's better than starving or getting kicked out of your house. Uh, if it ha you have to absolutely have to do it, um, you know, do it. If that's the only, if your credit's so bad, that's the only way you have credit. That's the reason those interest rates are so high. A lot of the people borrowing payday loans, have, they don't have any good any credit. You know, they can't get loans anywhere else. The lenders 
you know, a lot of these people might not even, you know, pay back their loans. So the lenders have to charge very high amounts of interest um, to, to be able to be viable. Uh, I'm not the kind of person, I don't think you should make something, you know, illegal, you know, or are or, or, or poor people with bad credit better off with the option at least to get a payday loan if they really, really have to have one. I think that they, they are better off. Uh, can, can you get quickly stuck in quicksand? If you're, I mean, if you're rolling over payday loans week after week after week and paying 400% a year interest, yeah, that's, that's a terrible situation to be in. So don't put yourself in, in that situation. Perfect. Andrew, uh, Crystal, did you have anything to add to that? I think it goes back to uh, kind of clarity with your money. Uh, one, one thing that I have been reading about in regarding to payday loans is they're typically the unbanked, right? So if um, one thing that is kind of really a, a good idea is to, to have a bank and then do direct deposit. So once you start working, have your money direct deposited into a bank, um, then you can really cut out the payday loans because you, you're your, your money is in the bank, you're already able to kind of access it through a debit card, so on and so forth. Um, and, and, you know, it's difficult, but take a hard look at, really, it's take a hard look at what you're spending. And I know it's, um, it's not easy, but maybe you can cut some things out. Uh, and, and, and that way you don't have to rely on payday loans to get your money faster. Thank you for that. So it looks like we got a couple questions. Um, so we'll start with the first one here from the, uh, someone from the audience. What are the pros and cons of borrowing from your 401k to pay off debt? And I'll leave that open to the panel, whoever would like to start off with that. I can I can start. Um, so one of the, the pros uh, that you can of doing that is one, it's usually a relatively low interest rate. And two, when you pay it back, you're actually paying yourself back. So you, you are your own lender. Um, so, you know, that that's can, can be helpful. Um, the risk that you get into is now, you know, whatever you were saving, whatever you were putting in uh, to your 401k on, on a monthly basis is now going to pay back your loan. So you're no longer uh, getting towards your goal of, of retirement savings. Um, and then the other is if for some reason something happened to your job, then that that loan is immediately due typically. So, um, you know, if you know, COVID happens and, and now you lose your job and you had been planning on paying back this loan over the next year, um, then all of a sudden it's due. And so, uh, and then, you know, if you don't have it, then it comes out and it goes back in, it becomes a taxable uh, thing. And, and so that can be, um, you know, a, a really bad uh, situation there because that, like all these other things that we've talked about, it ends up being so much more expensive than, than what it really needed to be. So, um, I don't, I'm not a big proponent. I don't think you, you should tap your 401k, but again, it's gonna be a whole lot better idea than, than trying to take a payday loan. <laughs> and if, if you're using it, you know, to pay off, say you've got a, a lot of credit card debt at 18 or 20%, it, it, it very well could be worth it to just knock that debt away, get rid of that interest, and then, you know, pay yourself back. That, you know, that could be an option. But again, it's not something to do. Four hundred one k loans can get a little tricky and a little complicated, and there are things that can go wrong uh, with them. Yeah, it, it's there. Are, there are, in my view, there are a lot more cons than pros in this kind of situation. Of course, none of us are giving you specific advice, so let's make sure we're clear on that. But um, take a look at kind of the cost in, embedded with it. Uh, one, uh, another thing to be cautious of is oftentimes with 401k loans, if you sever service with the provider, that loan becomes immediately due. Uh, and so, you know, if you're worried about your job in a situation or you get laid off, then now you're out that money, you need to pay that money back. Or, it'll, um, or what it can become is a taxable event, like Crystal said. And so, 
now not only do you uh, not only have you already taken the money out, but now you're going to have to pay more money to the IRS because it the uh, because it is a taxable event. Plus, if you're under 59 and a half, it becomes um, an additional penalty. Uh, so it's there. It's a it's a very it can become a complicated situation very quickly. Um, one thing, is, especially with kind of the CARES Act and everything that's going on virus, there are some provisions now to allow people to take some money out without um, with without any penalty. But really, it's it, I want I want everybody to kind of get educated and, and do their research on what makes the most sense. And like this person said, right, do a pros list for yourself and a cons list and truly look at what what could be a worst case scenario. If you're not able to pay that back, what would happen at that point? What would you do? Perfect. Thank you all for that. Um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, Crystal, you had mentioned Dave Ramsey. Um, does the group have any other suggestions on resources to help learn about debt or financial planning? So I, I, I like Dave Ramsey for, for certain instances. Um, you know, if you're uh, it, he's a, it's a great idea if you're just getting started um you know once you become a sophisticated investor have a, a you know some good amount of savings um then you know you, you need to to move on but um i think he's great for somebody who is is definitely just getting started um another book that i liked um and it's it's probably pretty old right now but i remember when i i as a a rice young alum i read it um it's called um smart women uh, get rich and then there was a smart couples get rich um, and so there and I think there's you know even more iterations of that same title uh, and I thought it did a great job of really uh, outlining you know what you needed to do you know how to get started investing how to make sure your debt is is managed well um, so th that was that's the one that I would recommend. Um, as somebody who got liberal arts degrees that had nothing to do with economics or finance, uh, I found Khan Academy absolutely an amazing resource. Uh, the finance and economics videos were, I think, some of the first ones he ever did, and they are top, top notch. I highly re recommend Khan Academy. It's free. Yeah, there are. Um, I've read so many finance books that it's actually really hard to kind of keep track of which one, um, which ones kind of rise above the rest. Uh, but I think uh, what's important when I when I when when we meet with people is just to understand kind of where you are and what your financial picture looks like overall, right? And so knowing that for yourself, um, right? Are you saving enough? You know, how much debt do you have? before you get into kind of the, the more interesting, sexier stuff like investing, right? I think it's, we want to, we want to uh, walk before, we want to crawl before we walk and we want to walk before we run. And oftentimes people are looking towards kind of the, the more exciting things that are going on before realizing, oh, I'm not even saving enough, right? Um, so I, I think just getting a better understanding of where you're, where you are yourself you know, and, and nobody likes doing a budget, but I think that is really important to kind of start with to know where, you, again, where your money is going. Um, so. Perfect. Thank you all. Um, we have another question here. Uh, what would you recommend to someone looking to get started in investing outside of a 401k? And whoever wants to start with that one. Um, I'm a big fan of creating uh, tax-free accounts for later. I think everybody should have a Roth IRA. Um, the four, a 401k, just so you understand the tax uh, situation, you don't the money you put in your 401k, you don't pay income tax on now. It grow the money in the 401k grows tax deferred. Then when you retire and start taking money out of it, you pay full income tax on every cent that comes out of it. The Roth IRA is the opposite. You pay your taxes up front and you put after tax money into the Roth, but then it grows tax deferred. And then when you take it out in retirement, you don't ever pay income taxes on it again. Um, 
the important thing, one, one important thing is to, is everyone knows about diversifying your, your investments. You should also be looking at tax diversification. You should also be making sure that in addition to, you know, taxable streams of income from your 401k and your retirement plans in the future, you're, you're also making some, some buckets of tax-free money to give you a little more flexibility when it does come to retirement. And you'll be able to sort of manage your tax brackets a little better that way. Um, so when, when we talk about investing, it's important to go back to what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? Um, and so when you start looking at that lens, there are multiple different types of accounts that you can look at, but it's a question of, you know, kind of time frame that you are investing in. If you're investing in the short term or the long term, if you're, if you need liquidity, if you, uh, meaning, do you need access to the money sooner or quickly, right? Like, um, cause some, uh, one thing is like, we could, we could be talking about equities. We could be talking about real estate. We could be talking about alternative investments. The, the, there are a lot of things that somebody could be interested in. Um, but I, I think I like to frame it as what are your goals and what are kind of any limitations or issues that might come up uh, Antoine talked about taxes, right? What are, if you're concerned about taxes? Uh, so it's a, it's, there's not one answer because there are so many different ways to look at it, that it is, um, important to know again, what your, what your situation is and what your goals are so that you can come kind of weigh the pros and cons to all the di different decisions. Perfect. We'll go on to the uh, the next question here. Um, what are the top three things a young person should do to start saving? Crystal, let's um, start with you for this one. All right. I think uh, a lot of the things that we've mentioned here um, are, are the top three. Um, so one, don't spend more than you have, you know, and if if you're somebody who has who struggles with consumer debt, credit card debt, then maybe you need to go to a cash cash system so that, you know, that just gives you some discipline to not spend more than what you have. Um, and then so you want to get get your debt down. You also, you know, want to start investing as early as you can, because it's it's uh, the time in the market or the time of investing has such a huge impact um, over, you know, what your your financial security is going to be in the long run. It, it's it's much more about, um, you know, time in the market than than it is about how much money you make. Um, and then the third thing I would say is um, get the, the phrase if on, it's only out, out of your, your vocabulary. So I, I hear people say, oh, well, it's only $5 for my Starbucks, or it's only $20 for this, or, you know, it's only $50. Um, that if only uh, attitude um, will really get you into trouble because all of those if it's only um, add up very, very quickly. And um, so just don't ever think of that, it, that even if it's a small amount, that it, it doesn't matter because it does. Um, and they add up quickly and it, it has a real impact. So don't ever say it's only just realize that, that yes, that is a dollar amount and that dollar amount is added to all the other dollar amounts. And if your goal is to get out of debt, then you need to bring all of those dollar amounts that you're spending down. I would, uh, I, those are fantastic for sure. Um, one other kind of thing uh, to think about is also if you have a match with your 401k, uh, because that's free money, right? That is 100% return on your, on your, on the money that you're already putting in at that point, um, which is, which is uh, not every company does it. So it is important to kind of be aware of what the, how much you need to contribute to, to um, put to get the match as well. Uh, that's a that's a nice little plus. Um, one method that a lot of uh, you know some people really like is back to that kind of cash idea is like having envelopes of money for the different um, for you know for all the different kind of things that you're going to save or put money towards on uh, or save or spend on. 
And that way you really have an idea of, of where your money is going. I, I, I'm really big on clarity, right? And transparency on where, where you spend your money because is it aligned with your, your goals and your values? And if it is, then that's great. But if it's not, is that something that you want to change? And, um, and psych- investor psychology and behavioral uh, becomes a really becomes part of what what we do is to get you over that hump and, and thinking of different ways to um, put uh, to what to do with your money. Um, talking about psycho- psychology, uh, people typically, and it's almost we all do this. You spend. If you're making an amount of a certain amount of money, that's how much you spend. And then when you get a raise, what's the first thing you do? You bump up your living standards until you hit that ceiling again, right? And you get another raise and you keep doing it. That's why, you know, people making, I know people making half a million dollars a year, they're up to their eyeballs in debt and they can't, you know, they're, they're, they think they're not going to make it, right? If you can, if, you know, if you're at this level of, of living, um, standard of living, and you get a raise, if you can stay at this standard of living and save all that raise money, you're going to come out way ahead. Also, it's a lot, a lot easier to, to stay at, at one standard of living than it is to go up a standard of living and then realize you can't afford it and have to have to go back down, right? That's almost impossible to do. But it's not that hard to just level off if you, you know, just resist that urge to, to keep bumping your standard of living up every time you start making more money. And instead, you know, put that towards your to retirement, invest it, put it towards your savings. And that way you, you, you can really, you'll really come out ahead that way. I'll add one more thing. Y'all are already doing, um, you're already educating yourselves on the situation, right? You're, 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 you've joined this because this is important to you. So, you know, read up as much as you can use the resources that we kind of talked about. Um, because it, it's, it's almost always better that you make the decision for yourself on what that, what you want your money to do. Uh, because me telling you is not, you're not going to necessarily listen to me, right? I might make the most sense in the world, but you don't care. So you're, you're, you're taking that first step, getting educated, understand your situation, um, and, and then seek out resources that will help benefit you for the long term. I want to add just one more thing. Um, also, just realize it, it's not forever. You know, once if you can do all the hard stuff in your 20s where you really keep your standard of living in check um, and you, you know, really work on getting that that debt down and, and, and conserve and et cetera, and you do all the right things in your 20s, by the time you're in your 30s or your 40s, you will really be able to loosen up. And so again, it's the, the more you can do as a young person, the more you will be able to do when you're older and, you know, and that can, that will compound. And so if you're really strict with yourself in your twenties and your thirties, you could retire when you're 50 or, or even earlier. So I've seen people do that, you know, it's just delayed gratification. So don't feel like it's going to be this way forever. This austerity that, that you're, you're, if you're trying to put yourself under it, that, that too will pass and, and you will get to the other side. These are all great points. I feel like I'm guilty of a lot of these. So thank you all for um, for these great, great points. Uh, so we got a couple more questions here. Um, this first one here, in what situations would someone benefit from hiring a certified financial planner? Whoever would like to answer that first. So I'm a CFP I'm uh, and have been um, for almost two decades now. And um, so, so CFPs can work in a couple different ways. You can hire one who is just independent, who will just do your financial plan for you. Um, and then you have CFPs who are like me, who work with an investment firm, like your, a UBS or a Morgan Stanley or, or that sort of thing, who will typically do your financial plan, but then also recommend an investment balance, uh, an investment strategy for you. Um, and, and I'm sure our, our other panelists have CFPs in, in their firms who, who focus more on the insurance side of it. Uh, but, um, you know, we can, 
when things get complicated, um, that's really when you need a CFP. So if you have income coming from various different things, not just your 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 one employer, um, or if you're self-employed, sometimes that can get complicated. If you start to have multiple properties, um, if you have multiple goals, uh, if you you know you're not just saving for retirement and in college for a couple of kids, and so now your goals are getting more complicated. So when things start to get more complicated then you know what to do with. That's really where you need to bring a CFP in. Um, and then for, for some people that's, you know, that, that's right away. Uh, but I, I think there, some of the books that we've talked about and the resources out there can get you through the, the first few hurdles. Um, but once things get complicated is when I would say you really need to have a CFP. And then on the flip side of that is once you get really close to one of those goals. So if you're in your 40s and, and you're you know, 10 or 15 years out, you really need to start thinking about, well, eventually I do want to retire. Am I on the right track? Um, that's where a CFP can really help to, to make sure that yes, you, either you are on the right track or, or no, you need to make some, some drastic changes in order to uh, be able to get to those goals that, that you have. Perfect. Yeah, I would agree. It, it's a it's a question of complexity. Um, it's a question of complexity or clarity, right? Or um, and, or additionally, if uh, if you don't know where to start, then or you won't be able to hold yourself to kind of um, you know investing or or staying on track, then having somebody that that can potentially keep you accountable is is useful as well. Uh, but I would say that for most people, when you're starting out, especially like y'all are, there are a lot of resources available. Um, if you're in Houston, there's actually uh, a community organization that does free workshops to get people kind of thinking about thinking about money. So look around to what's local and what's available. Um, apply the lens for yourself on what you think kind of makes sense of, of where what's important to you, where you want to go. And, uh, and, and so most people, I would say, don't really need a, a CFP until much, much later on, or it's a big decision, potentially retirement, right? Because retirement is going to be a, a very different uh, landscape uh, because you're now living on your investments and not on your income anymore. Uh, so there, there, there are, to me, there are kind of these moments in time that would make a lot of sense, uh, tax complications. It, or business owners, um, if you're a business owner, you really, it'll, it can become very complicated very quickly uh, um, and so on. Uh, I, like to, I like to compare having a financial plan or any kind of financial professional to basically like a fitness coach. I mean, look, you, you can go to the gym on your own. You don't even need to go to the gym. You can work out in your living room. You can run around the, the neighborhood you know, you can work out and get in shape basically for free and just do it all yourself. Some people like to hire somebody who, you know, a coach is going to keep them accountable, you know, keep them, you know, come up, help them come up with the plan, keep them along, going along with their plan. And, um, you know, that can be valuable to, you know, more valuable to some people who, who, who don't think they can just do it on their own. And, uh, you know, I guarantee that, you know, Tiger Woods and the and and sports professionals and Olympic athletes, they're not they don't just work out at home on their own plan. They're paying coaches a lot of money to come up with plans for them. So, um, you know, see, you know, you know, serious people with lots, lots of money or, or complex financial arrangements very often will will want to have a coach, you know, helping them out um, with all those things. And furthermore, you know, in the finance field, we, we all want to think that we're, we're coming up with these, br you know, brilliant investment plans for our clients that, that you know, going to make them millions of dollars in the future. But quite honestly, a lot of our job is being an emotional coach. And most people, you know, you all hear, well, you know, buy low, sell high, right? That's exactly the opposite of most, what most people do with their investments. They, 
you know, investments, they, they see something going sky high, it, it's high, you know, record highs, that's when they want to buy into that investment. Then when the stock market crashes and their investment gets cut in half, that's when they panic and that's when they want to sell. And a lot of times, you know, a financial advisor's job is just you, you call it, you know, you call them up and say, oh my gosh, you know, I want to sell, I want to sell, everything's falling apart. They'll say, look, we have a plan. You know, we've accounted for this. You don't need this money for 10 or 15 years or whatever. Let's ride this out. You know, don't, don't make emotional decisions. And a lot of times, um, you know, you, it's easy to make emotional decisions with your own money. Part of what you pay professionals to do is to have an unemotional, detached eye to look at your money. You know, it's not there, you know, it's not my money. It's, it's your, I'm not as emotionally invested in it. I'm less likely to make a dumb emotional decision than someone might be with their own money. So that's, that's another one of the valuable things just as a, as a, as a coach to keep you accountable, just like a, just like a fitness coach. Perfect. All good points. Thank you. We'll go on to the uh, next question here. Um, we had mentioned retirement earlier. Uh, what are your thoughts on early retirement or um, fire movement? Whoever would like to start with that. I think it's fantastic. It gives people um, multiple things, right? It means that they have they they have been purposeful with their money in saying, "I want to retire at age 40, 50, whatnot." Um, they have an understanding of how much money they need to live on and how much money that they want to kind of spend in retirement. I think uh, as, as people become more thoughtful in that, that is, that is fantastic. It's obviously not for everybody uh, because one thing that then becomes even more important is, is really the planning for that uh, for the long term. Uh, the fire movement's really only been around for, you know, five to 10 years. Uh, and that, um, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think that there has been a, a lot of thought into it, but there are, there are still some issues that uh, could arise because this is kind of the first, um, first huge volatility kind of hit that's happened while this while this uh, movement has been around, right? Um, there are depressed interest rates, and that can affect kind of how how people's portfolios perform. So, it it ha it hasn't been studied enough for longer term longer periods of time. So, if you do retire at forty and then you live till 80, 90, you're depending on all of that for a really long time. And who knows what that's going to kind of look like in the future? Um, there are definitely some other issues kind of along along that uh, along that standpoint uh, with healthcare, Medicare. What are you doing for health insurance? And uh, and even Social Security. What that's going to look like when when you are able to claim Social Security. So I think, like I said. People thinking about it is fantastic. If you're able to accomplish it, it's fantastic. Having multiple streams of income uh, it, it are just really different ways to kind of accomplish what you're doing. The, the other caveat is, of it is, is kind of what are you gonna do with all this free time? You know, some people were planning on traveling and now in a, in a COVID environment, they're not able to travel. So they're kind of not accomplishing kind of what they were looking for. So think about what you're, what, what's important to you. Is it more time with your kids? Is it more time with family? Is it traveling? And, and what are you really looking to accomplish? And maybe that's something that you can do while you're working instead of, instead of there as well. Crystal or Antoine, did you have anything to add to that? I think, you know, it, it goes back to uh, your financial plan. You know, if if that's your goal, then great. You know, everybody has different goals. And um, if your, you know, financial plan, you know, we in our financial planning, we do a, a Monte Carlo simulation where we run 10,000 different scenarios projecting your 
uh, your finances into the future. And it looks a lot like a, a hurricane cone. <laughs> and so there's, uh, you know, the, the longer that you have to plan for, the more variability in those outcomes is going to be. So, but if your financial plan, even, you know, at the 90th percentile is giving you a success rate, then, you know, I would say, then that's great. That gives you the flexibility to, you know, do what you want. And whether that's doing a, a job that doesn't pay is enough to, you know, manage your lifestyle or travel or some of the other things that, that were already mentioned. Um, you know, it just gives you that flexibility. You know, the other, or it just lets you know that at any point in time that even if you don't retire, because you you like your job, you've got the you've got your nest egg there that you could at any point in time say take this job and shove it and and you've got that flexibility because everything's already in place. So, uh, one thing I would like to say, um, it's not it's not as exciting as, as talking about investments, but when we're talking about you know lifetime financial planning you do have to spend some time on insurance and making sure disability insurance, life insurance, long-term care insurance, because you can have the, you know, the best laid plans in the world. You know, you're making all this money at your job, you're saving all this money, you're going to have this great retirement. But if you get disabled and you can't do that job anymore, your retirement plans are going to go out the window or, you know, God forbid you pass away and you got, you know, a family depending on you and, 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 you know, your wife or your spouse's retirement. Um, the, don't, don't forget the insurance part of financial planning in, in addition to the investments and the retirement type stuff. Perfect. Thank you all. We'll go to the next question here. Um, any advice on merging finances with the partner when both have debt? And whoever would like to start us off on that one. <laughs> Again, it's tricky. Um, so, I would if you are, um, you know, in a, a a very strong, committed relationship, then I would look at it as a a just one picture. So, all of these things that we mentioned um, on on how you can get out of debt by either uh, paying down the items that are are either the smallest balances first or the highest interest rate first you would do that as a couple. So, I mean, if you are taking all of your income and pooling it, then you would take all of your debt and pool it and, and the same principles would apply. So, um, you know, just be, be very sure that you're in a very committed long-term relationship because you certainly don't want to be taking, <laughs> pulling all your, your income and paying off your partner's debt and then for five years down the road. Um, for the a relationship to end, and and now you still have all of your debt. And anyway, so so there's uh, certainly a lot of a lot of things that um, that that can go wrong. But the if you are merging um, your finances, then you, you would just you would apply the same principle at, at, to the whole, as opposed to just your piece of the pie. I I maybe yeah to told. So I may be old fashioned, but I would recommend if you're serious enough to be combining your finances together, I would I would get married before, before you, you make any joint bank accounts. Simply there are tax reasons. It's a little generally a little more tax advantageous to file jointly as a married couple. When you do end up in retirement, um, some of your your IRAs, 401ks, it's a lot easier to transfer those to spouses on better tax their better tax treatment on spousal transfers rather than like leaving it to your kids. There, there are a lot of legal uh, and tax advantages of getting married. And if you're at the point where you're, I wouldn't combine finances unless you're going to get married as well. I would do it as a package, but that's, that's just me. I guess I'm old fashioned. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> all, all really good points. I think it, obviously Hopefully, obviously, I think the lines of communication need to be really good and clear about where you both stand. Uh, I have a friend who her uh, before she got married, the stipulation was that they both had to get get rid of debt before they could get married. Right. And so that way it was kind of a, a clean slate. It was is equal on that front. Um, but I, I do think that it's important that uh, as you're going through a committed relationship, thinking about what your long-term goals are, 
and being transparent with with all the the money issues that kind of can come to pass. Uh, we know that um, oftentimes divorces is one of the kind of top three reasons of getting to getting uh, for a couple to get divorced is because of money reasons. So please be you know open and honest with your partner about what's going on, and y'all can uh, kind of get through it together in knowing what it is that's important for y'all for your goals, um, for your goals and what your financial situation is like. Perfect, thank you all. So we got about four minutes left, so this will probably be my last question here. What is something that you know now about managing debt that you wish you would have known, let's say, you know, 10 years ago? <laughs> Sorry, for that one, let's start off with, let's start off with you, Crystal. All right, I, I think I'll, I'll reiterate some of the things that I, I've already said um, that, you know, everything that you spend counts, even even the small amount. So uh, again, get the it's only uh, out of your out of your vocabulary, knowing that the more you do now, it will it will compound more than you can possibly believe in in 20 years from now. You'll So if you you know, make the hard choices and defer the gratification. Now you will be so happy <laughs> 20 years from now, you will just be amazed at, at where you are financially. Um, and, um, you know, and I think, you know, what Andrew keeps coming back to, and I, I definitely agree is, is know what your goals are. Spend some time to really think about, well, what is it that's important to you? And, um, you know, if having financial security is important to you, then then getting out of debt is important to you. And some people, um, you know, again, this comes back to investor behavior is uh, like to move towards goals and some people like to move away from things. And so um, Antoine mentioned, well, what if, you know, these bad scenarios happen, you want to make sure that that you're you're prepared for that. So if that motivates you, then then think about well, I'm doing this so that I can avoid X, Y, and Z. Whereas other people are more motivated by you know look thinking okay, well I want to be able to do all these wonderful things in in the future and and so that's what I'm working towards. And so sometimes if you when you're just thinking about your goals and, and making sure that they're clear, uh, kind of see if you can figure that out about yourself is if you should think about your goals. Are you, are you working towards something? Are you working uh, to, to move away and protect yourself from something? Um, I know when I, I made that shift for myself, it made a big impact too. Yeah, uh, fully agreed. Know your know your goals and know your situation. Uh, and and uh, and one thing we didn't really talk about uh, too much is is you know um, you don't have to do it every day, but just have an idea. You know, if it's monthly or quarterly, I would say at least annually. But have an idea of kind of what what you have going on and take a snapshot so that you know where your money is going. And is it, again, is it going towards the goals and the values that you care about? And if it's not, then, then make some changes because we can, we can all, and there is an investor, there is um, a behavioral side of all these things. So knowing for yourself how you react to it, right? How you react to, to money, these situations going forward um, and, and get, um, and potentially get, you know, uh, a, a therapist or a counselor if, if those are holding you back as well. Anything from you, Antoine? Oh, I just, um, I think it's important to understand opportunity cost and cash flow, uh, what I'm getting at is not all debt is bad. I, this happened to a friend of mine. He had about a million dollar trust fund. Um, it was making about 5% since, you know, invested in the market. So making about 5% on average year. He wanted to buy a house, he, to say a half a million dollar house, right? 
Well, so he says to himself, do I want to borrow the money or do I just want to take it out of my trust? You know, maybe I don't want to borrow money from the bank and have a mortgage. Let's just pay off the house in cash. I'll go to my trust fund. I'll take half, you know, $50,000 out and pay for the house. Well, that sounds great and all, but then when you realize, well, he can get a mortgage at about two and a half percent interest on his mortgage. Why would he take in, you know, half a million dollars in investments that's making 5% a year, sell those investments and now get 0% a year. It may, if he goes out and borrows the hundred, the, the half a million dollars at two and a half percent, he's still netting two and a half percent from the 5% that, 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 that money's making in his trust fund. So, you know, not all debt is bad. If you can borrow money for cheaper than whatever return you're investing it in, by all means, you know, that that's certainly a good thing to do. The, the only problem is it, again, it's consumer debt versus a type of investment debt. Perfect, thank you all. Well, we are at time. Um, I would like to thank all of our panelists here, uh, Crystal, Andrew, Antoine, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, I think this was all great advice. I know I learned something for sure. I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, just a couple reminders um, here for the audience. Um, for our young alumni who are out there, uh, just a reminder that this Saturday will be our Young Alumni Halloween Mixer from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, please be sure to join us. There'll be a pumpkin carving contest as well. Um, there's a special prize uh, Rice Alumni um, gift package for um, whoever wins the pumpkin carving contest. So be sure to join us for that. Very excited for that. And of course, costumes are highly encouraged. Um, be sure to visit the Cadence platform as a part of Al Together. There's over 100 events going on this week. So be sure to visit that and check out all the different events that are out there. And of course, this is the um, third topic in our four topic series for the Young Alumni um, Life Series. So next Friday, November 6th from 12 to 1 p.m. Central Time will be our final session that'll talk about Home Buying 101. But once again, thank you to our um, panelists. Thank you to the audience out there for tuning in and I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>